We're going to go now to Ed Lavendera, who is uh, still in Nacogdoches, Texas, uh, where there has been a lot of debris on the ground. Uh, Ed, what are you seeing? Anderson, really, Nacogdoches is just a just one of the one of the many areas that has seen debris fall over over the area over the course of the last uh, of the today. And uh, a lot of people here. This is uh, in downtown Nacogdoches, which, in a weird way, has kind of become a, a central gathering spot for a lot of the residents here. Early on throughout the day, we saw a lot of people just gathering here. There's a a small piece of debris in the middle of this parking lot that has been roped off, and now military officials are standing guard over it as waiting uh, for someone to uh, come by and pick it up here. We do understand we have CNN crews. In the, uh, in, in the areas just outside of Nacogdoches who say that there are NASA officials in the area. And now we begin the process of trying to figure out which pieces of debris will be collected at first. And as we've heard NASA officials say, gathering this evidence will be very crucial to them as they, they're able to put together, uh, the, as they're able to continue their investigation as to what might have happened today. So uh, very crucial work. Also the warning from authorities that perhaps some of these pieces might be toxic in some way. So they're urging people to stay away. We have heard reports from uh, hospitals in the area where people have checked themselves in just because they happen to have handled some of these pieces earlier on in the day before a lot of this news broke out that they shouldn't touch it. And so a lot of people are getting themselves uh, checked out and nothing major to report from that. Uh, but we do also understand that there are reports now that uh, uh, body parts have been found southeast here of Nacogdoches. So, uh, you know, kind of a, a exclamation point there to what, uh, what we already know, has, uh, know to be a, a tragic day here in the East Texas area. And many of the people here have started, started coming out very early and sharing their stories among each other. It's almost become kind of an odd scene at times where we've seen fragments of material where people have come with cameras, video cameras to uh, take pictures of, of uh, the scenes that are out here. We saw one portion uh, near downtown here where there was a just a small, tiny piece of uh, debris on a sidewalk and it couldn't have been more than three inches wide and three inches tall and there must have been a group of about 20 people hovering over it. Nobody touching it but everybody taking pictures of it and uh, that's kind of what we've seen here all day so uh, kind of an odd twist to what has been happening here throughout the day, Anderson. Yeah, Ed, uh, we talked to uh, another reporter uh, nearby who was saying, uh, who showed us actually a video of, of a hearse, uh, some officials uh, moving a, basically a body bag. Um, obviously, uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, very gruesome work ahead for, for these investigators. I'm curious, though, Ed, about uh, what sort of resources local authorities there have to deal with this, this wide pattern of debris. I spoke earlier with a woman by the name of Dorothy Langford. She was in her home when, uh, when, when the explosion happened, and a piece of debris landed in her yard. Police came to the scene, uh, but then they left. They cordoned off the area, and they basically left, and she's still in her home with this piece of debris in her front yard sort of waiting for federal authorities to show up. Are, are authorities spread very thin there in terms of trying to police secure all these areas? I think what they've what has happened, they've gotten hundreds of phone calls today reporting debris in, in, in many locations. We've seen in, in some situations where private landowners have cordoned off the area themselves and then they've called called in the report. We do understand that all local and, and state authorities are working the situation and responding to all these calls as, as best they can. There's also help that has come in from the Fort Hood Army Base, which is in Central Texas, just a couple of hours away from here as well, that are being lent in to help out in this situation. Uh, but I think also they're in the process of categorizing which exactly which pieces of debris they should visit first. You know, there's uh, some pieces that are bigger than others, and so perhaps that's kind of the way they're they're, uh, they're sending out the troops in terms of being able to collect all of all of this. But we do see, and remember, Anderson, that this area, parts of East Texas, can be very rural, very woody area, a lot of a lot of forest as well. So there might be debris uh, scattered across areas that could take some days to reach. All right, Ed Lavendera, Nacogdoches, Texas. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. We're going to go now to Bob Franken, who uh, earlier was at the uh, Air and Space Museum. Um, Get some getting feedback from people uh, visiting that uh, that monument in Washington. Bob, still here, Anderson. The museum is closed, but I wanted to give you a sense of it. You can see behind me this section here was devoted to the Columbia shuttle mission. That's a model of it in back of me, of course. This is the world's busiest museum. Nine million people plus come here a year, mostly to celebrate flight. But today they were flocking here to mourn. Continue to meet with you and keep you informed of just how this is progressing. Here at the display established to highlight this Columbia Space Shuttle mission, they gathered in front of the screen set up to monitor mission control. Now they were watching sad history unfold. When I heard it, I almost thought, is, am I watching a repeat of the Challenger? Because um, 
but it said it was live news, and I was really stunned, and I thought, oh my gosh, it's happened again. That's horrific. Yeah. Uh, it's how do you explain, you know, your family members uh, are gone in, a, in yeah, an instant. In instant. You're waiting for them to come down, and now they're gone. Among those with the most poignant reactions, the visitors from Israel. Their countryman, Ilan Rimon, was the first Israeli astronaut on a U.S. space mission. It had been the rare occasion for national happiness in these tumultuous times. But now? That's a great loss. It's a tragedy. Um, as an Israeli, I mourn and grieve with the families and the friends of the crew that was lost, of course, with the Israeli and American people. Uh, it's, a, it's a bad day, but I hope in the future it'll, it'll have a more successful ending than this one. The muted sadness here at this impromptu shrine to the disaster was echoed nearly everywhere. Pure shock. Disbelief. This is unreal. I mean, you're, you come out here expecting to see a shuttle land and it's just not there. We feel so sad and sorry for the families of people that have been lost. As the tragedy sank in, the first flowers appeared at the museum's model of Columbia. The uh, flowers uh, are expected to grow tomorrow. Uh, it's in a certain way, Anderson, spaceflight even here has been considered routine because there have been so many years of safe returns until now. Anderson? Uh, Bob, you know, I was uh, looking at the biography of a lot of these astronauts, and not only do they have extraordinary resumes, extraordinary careers and interests behind them, but just about every one of them, from the time they were a child, they dreamed of being an astronaut. I'm interested to, to see if you ran into any kids today uh, at the museum and, and got any sense of whether or not this kind of a thing diminishes their interest in space, their enthusiasm for, for you know, dreaming of one day being an astronaut. You know, it was, it, it is a, it's such a good question, and it's the first thing you do think of as, as you were talking to the children. I talked to any number of them, uh, little girls and little boys, and a lot of them said yes at one time. That is something they wanted to do, but none of them said that this would cause them not to do it. Uh, they said, as a matter of fact, on a couple of occasions that uh, it would sort of rededicate them. I, I was really quite moved by the very, very mature reaction I got from so many of the kids who expressed a very, very quiet, somber reaction, of course, shock and all that kind of stuff, but said uh, almost to a person that uh, all this means is the space program must go forward. Uh, it makes me think, too, of, of uh, I remember seeing a CN, CNN report at some time in the last two weeks or so about a group of kids in Seattle who were ha they had an experiment with ants in an, in an ant farm that was actually on this shuttle. I can only wonder what, uh, what they are thinking at this moment. Bob Franken, thanks a lot. A nice report. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go back to uh, Michael Bond, who uh, we talked to just a few moments ago in Washington, uh, the man who uh, was director of what they call the sit room, the situation room in, uh, in the White House. Uh, he was director of the situation room back in 1986 when the space shuttle Challenger uh, had met its disaster. Um, Michael, thanks for coming back with us. I I'm sure. curious to know what you think went on in the sit room in the White House today before President Bush was summoned back from Camp David. Sure. Um, every time a crisis breaks over the White House horizon, uh, the duty officers kind of go into automatic. They, they know what to do and they know how to handle things like this. And, and in my research for my book, Nerve Center, I realized that the process really hasn't changed much since the Cuban Missile Crisis. The first thing they do is alert everyone on the White House staff what they know about. And then they try to get more information. Uh, were there any survivors? Was there a terrorist angle to it? And then they get ready for the phone calls. Um, you've mentioned on several occasions that the president called Ariel Sharon. Uh, the Situation Room organizes all calls from the president to foreign heads of state. So they knew they were going to get ready for that. And they were the ones that organized the president's return calls to all of the foreign heads of states that called with their condolences. Then they knew they prob would probably be involved in the connection of the president to the families, helping the White House switchboard and the White House communications agency get that connection to those people. Once things slowed down a little bit, they probably sat down and write, wrote a summary of what happened, what they knew about uh, so far, and sent that upstairs. Uh, it's a pretty set routine for them, whether it's a Challenger uh, explosion or today's event or a terrorist incident. And I suppose in a situation like this, uh, knowing what you don't know is almost as important as knowing what, what you know. You have to report 
negatives because a partial report suggests there might be something else out there. So every time you tell somebody upstairs what you know, you tell them what you don't know and how hard you're trying to get it. And is it a scene of, I mean, you, you talked about it almost being a routine. Uh, obviously, uh, you and, and, and the people who are in the Situation Room now are professionals, but, I mean, is there, is there adrenaline? Is there excitement? Is there fear? W what is it like? Oh, absolutely. Um, and there's many examples of that over the years. When Reagan was shot, there was a good bit of confusion and fear and, and ignorance in that room. Uh, other instances are just as bad uh, at 9-11. There was a good bit of fear because everyone evacuated the White House except the sit-room staff. And people gravitate to the sit-room during these circumstances, mainly to find out what's going on, pick up on the latest, talk to so-and-so. It's, uh, it's not only the White House Alert Center, it oftentimes turns into the White House Help Desk.